Good morning. God is good? All the time. All the time? God is good. Amen. Um, two quick youth announcements, of course. You've probably seen the announcements in the bulletin, but BBS does start tonight over at the Methodist Church, and it is not too late to register your little kids, uh, pre-K through fifth grade. And volunteers, sixth grade and older adults, you are welcome um, to volunteer. Um, we're there Sunday through Thursday night this week. Um, the other thing that's not in here, but I have sent out an email to my Alliance distribution list for the parents, um, is we are planning a trip to the Creation Museum on Monday, August 11th, prior to going back to school. This is something we're going to do maybe every two or three years, um, and it's for sixth grade, middle school, and up. And um, if you're interested, please see me. I'll have an announcement with more of the details um, in the next week's bulletin, and that way we'll be sending out more uh, announcements about that through email. But there is zip lining involved as well. But that should be a great experience for our kids also. Thank you. For the uh, school supplies, uh, we'd like to have all those in by next Sunday so that I can compile all the bags to distribute on the 10th. Uh, but if you still have supplies, bring them on the 10th. Uh, we'll still take them. Um, we still need quite a few crayons, glue sticks, pencils, and a few scissors uh, to make at least one item for each child. Uh, they did request multiple items of uh, multiple, uh, two dozen pencils per child and, and two boxes of crayons and five glue sticks. Uh, but uh, my goal is to at least give them one box of crayons and one dozen pencils and uh, at least two, two or three glue sticks. But uh, so if we get more, that's great, but at least if we can get that minimum in. So uh, I saw a lot of people put it, put it in the uh, box today, so thank you. And people are giving me some money so I can go shopping. And <laughs> I love to buy school supplies. Um, so uh, if you want to give me money, I'll go buy it for you and bring it in. Um, but if not, please bring it in by next Sunday so we can compile all that for the kindergarten and first grades. I do have little uh, sale slips back there to tell what, what sales each store has this week, what the prices are, the best I could find. Uh, so if you need one of those to take with you for shopping, and also a chart as to what we have and what we still need. So and check it out back there on the table. So thank you.
Please stand with me. Thank you. We have the time to worship the three word of confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are time to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We continue our worship with our open <laughs> Oh. And also with you. Mm -hmm. Go 
glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Heart 
knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Jesus Christ who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Of repentance. 
Charlie wouldn't have made that connection, would you? But the picture of repentance. If you thought of repentance as tear-stained remorse or as a desire to do better, this parable might not sound much like repentance. It seems the man stumbled onto a treasure by accident, and then instead of advertising in the lost and found, or going to the police and telling them what they found, he didn't do any of that jazz. He went to everything he had, disposed of everything he owned, and went and bought that field. Yet in a real way, this is repentance, because both parts of the movement Jesus calls repentance is present. First, because the treasure was so great, the man sacrificed everything he had, selling everything that he could come up with, and turned it into cash. Then he ran out to the field to take hold of the treasure. Martin Luther spoke of this movement in his explanation of the meaning of baptism for daily living. As God gives his gifts, the old Adam dies, and a new self, a new you arises, getting wrapped up in the promise. Perhaps none of us have stumbled across a treasure in the field, but most of us have found treasure of one sort or another, and have gone through the same kind of movement as the man in the Pharaoh. Maybe you discovered an old Harley Davidson, or maybe a Model T Ford, or some other automobile, in somebody's old, old um, barn. And that was the treasure you found. Maybe that you discovered you have a flair for art, or are drawn to music, or dance. Maybe a treasure is your thirst for knowledge, or your ability to be with people in crisis. Or maybe you work well with wood and you love wood and, and you, you are able to bring out the, the grain and the texture and, and that which was alive and now is on your, on your, on your table that you're working with comes alive again in, in the way that you're able to work with it. Perhaps you love restoring antiques. Or perhaps your treasure is working with children or the elderly. If anything like these examples have taken place in your life, then you've already experienced the first movement of repentance. Then for the joy of being good at your music or dance or whatever, you begin to let go of other things that have become important to you over time. You might uh, give up watching television in the evening so you can go work in your workshop, or you can go to the dance studio, or you can go visit someone, an elderly person, or, or maybe you tutor in, in the school system, and, and you give up time during your day to go do that. Or maybe you rise early in the morning so you have an hour or two of precious time that you can give over to your study or your, or, or your thirst for knowledge around a particular topic so you have time to research on the internet and get involved in that. And as long as your passion is alive, you will keep on clearing less important commitments out of the way to make room for that which is most important to you. How many found that to be true? How many gone through that in your life, done different things? Maybe when you were young, maybe you were sports minded, right? You love sports or whatever. And by God, you did clear things out. You got it out of the way, off your schedule. So you have time. Maybe some people love golf. And they set aside time in their schedule to go hit balls and cranes, to go golfing. They get up early in the morning, so they get there early before it gets too hot to go play around the golf. All those things, you crowd other things out to make space and time and energy for those things you truly, truly love. That's what the first sign of the movement of repentance is like. And if you've ever done it, you've already experienced it. It has little to do with crocodile tears or, or promises to do better or, or feelings of remorse. No, it has everything to do with letting go. With letting go. Letting go of the past. Letting go of guilt and shame. Now, I was thinking about this. You know, sometimes it's appropriate to feel guilty or to have shame about something that we've done. And once you've felt that, and you turn it over to God, you release it. But you know, if you hang on to that, you know what that's about? That's about Matt being in control of things. That's putting me first again. You know how you understand what I'm talking about? If you can't let go of 
that have been of the God and trust that God has wiped it out. And the Lord's already forgotten about it because He promises to do that, to remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. That's about as far as you can get. Well, Lupin back around closer to it. Well, we want to close the loop and hang on because it puts me in control. It's all about me instead of God at that point. It's to let go of preconceived notions and ideas about life. It's to let go of preconceived, uh, preconceived notions about God, about ourselves. Letting go of commitments to the God of racism, nationalism, sectarianism, humanism, or whatever it is you want to throw in that box. Letting go of the future and the control we would like to exercise over the future. Letting go of commitments that pull us away from our baptism and from the Eucharist and from all the promises that the Father has given to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. To be sure, there is sorrow in letting go. Have you ever noticed, even if something good is happening in your life, but it means a change? Maybe you're uh, moving to a new house. Maybe you're moving to the dream job you always wanted. Maybe you're moving into retirement and you couldn't wait to retire, whatever it is. Even if it's a wonderful, good, exciting thing, any change in your life causes grief. It does. Whether it's good or bad or you hope it would never happen to you, whatever it is, even good things, even good changes cause grief in your life, create sorrow. Sometimes in letting go, we have sorrow over perhaps harming a neighbor or, or a community or ourselves or a tip that went on with another member of the congregation. There's sorrow in making difficult sacrifices, letting go of things that have been important to us, perhaps things about which we've based the substance of our very lives. Hey, you know, as I get older, I'll be 60 in September. I know a lot of you say, oh, I wish I was 60 again. And those who are younger say, man, is he old? I know he's older than dirt. You know. <laughs> well, look, if, 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 as we age, don't you grieve things, chapters in your life? I mean, you know, you can't hardly wait until the kids are big enough to change their own underwear and, and go to the bathroom themselves. And then you turn around and say, man, I, I, I miss that. You know what I mean? And then you can't wait and go, no, yeah, because I'm just saying, because she had the run of that at our house. Well, I'm going to say, but, but then they get a little older, you know, and they're in school and stuff, and you go, wow. And the next thing they want the keys to the car, and you go, wow. And, you know, you got to make a church, you know. And then they get, they're, they're out of that, and they're in college, they thank God, you know, they just get them out of college, they're home free. And then they get out of college, they get married, and pretty soon they're gone. They're gone. And you're lucky if they call you once a week. And that's okay, because you understand they have their own life to live. And that's good. You raised them that way. You wanted them to be self-sufficient and loving people and wonderful people. And, and you got back and think, thank you, Lord. That's fabulous. And then you sit on the other side and look at your spouse and go, well, what are we doing now? <laughs> Is it your turn to cook or my turn to cook tonight? Oh, that's a lot. Let's just go out. Let's go out. Uh, I mean, you know, there are passages in time. And, and every time, you know, you grieve the closing of that chapter in your life. And that's, that's right. It's appropriate. That's what happens. Even as you begin to say, okay, now we're in a new chapter. What's that going to look like for us? And then you get fear and trepidation. You know, what is it going to look like for us? And then you try to find the good in it. And that's not to give you the strength, the ability, the grace to live fully into whatever chapter I'm in. And to do that with God's grace and goodness. To keep alive a life of sanctification and growing up in my faith. And just about the time you think you got something nailed down right in your life, everything changes. The whole map changes. And you're right back trying to figure it out one more time. But that's what life's about. It's about growing. It's about grieving. It's about opening yourself to new things. And that's why in Christian faith there is no retirement. You don't get to retire. You can't say, well, I've done that for 30 years, let somebody else go. Okay, fine, let somebody else go. What are you going to do? What's your next chapter? What is God calling you to do now in this portion of your life? Let the other go. But that's not an excuse why we all can be engaged in the work of the kingdom of God as long as we have life and breath within us. We're still on. We're still viable. And who knows? Look, if you think you're going up to heaven and there's some 
hard for you to play. Well, maybe they're hard for some music instruments. But well, let me tell you, if you don't think you're going to be pressed into doing something the Lord's gave to them, you're, you're crazy. You're just crazy. Only there, you're going to do the things you love and have a passion for. Only in a perfect situation, a perfect place, with a perfect body. And that will be wonderful and good. Because God knows we need things. You know, we generally, most of us don't flourish if we have nothing to do. You ever notice that? If we don't have a passion, we don't have something to do, we just kind of die in the line and wither away. Now, there are people like my father who retired did nothing except golf. And he flourished. He looked better, you know, in retirement than he ever did working on the railroad. I'm just telling you. He blossomed in retirement. But, but he's, he's the exception. You know, he's a unique individual. Most of us can't do that. I couldn't do that. And I don't think most of you can either. So wherever we are in life, God has something for us to do that's valuable, a plan for you that changes completely over your lifetime. Different facets that you don't even know exist now. He's going to put you in places and, and ways that you can be effective and then full of joy and vim and vigor. And you will grieve and you will have joy. All at the same time. Co-mingle together. How does that happen? I don't know. But it does. That's all I know for my life. It happens. It really does. And all of that is the first part of repentance. That letting go. And once that's started, the other side follows. The taking hold of the gift. The taking hold, embracing of the gift. You know, my one question I ask my confirmation students, and I've said this before, so you know the answer already. Right? What's well, one question when you look at Jesus in the eye when you see him, you don't want him to ask you? Huh? You ever thought about that? Or it's just crazy people like me and maybe Dick and a few other people sit around and ponder these things that there are no, no problem. There's no answer to the right or wrong. But, you know, for you, what would it be? Jesus looking at you, he's like, well, this what one little question now. Just got to ask. And you know, it's the foot is going to, the shoe's going to drop. It would be this. Why wouldn't you allow me to love you? Where, what rock do you crawl on? It was, it was uh, Sunday and I wanted to be out playing golf. That's going to, that'll work for Jesus. Uh, it was a Tuesday and I'm going to convene it for me, you know, to do this or that. You know, take time to listen to somebody. Why would, you know, a Tuesday's bad for you to love me? I'm sorry, it was Wendy, that didn't work out well. And then why, why, ends and why it didn't work out well for me to allow myself to be loved? You can't do anything to make God love you. That's his choice, just like your parents. They either do or they don't. But you have the right of refusal to reject their love. And you have the right to refuse to reject God's love or to embrace the gift. But it always comes with unintended consequences, right? God's love in your life has an unintended consequence. It's going to transform you and change you. And make you the person God has always seen you to be and wants you to be. And your old self doesn't want that to happen. Because none of us want to die to ourselves. And that's what has to happen. We die that Christ comes alive and lives in us. The hope of glory. Sell everything, the man said. Sell everything I got. Liquidate it all. I'm buying that field. And he does. He lets everything else go. So it's a person who wants to be a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as this happens, as the gift, the promise of God takes hold in you and me, our whole way of seeing ourselves, the world, is changed forever. So that Paul says, we walk in newness of life. Then God is no longer seen as a lucky rabbit's foot. Some, something you talk away, you don't want it to know it's really there, but just in case you need God, you want to be at least on talking terms with God. So if you need him to bail you out, he's going to be that lucky rabbit's foot, you know, he's always around. Or head against that times. But God is now seen for who God is. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The one who comes by grace to dwell in our hearts by faith, by simple trust. The one who comes through the cross and resurrection and knits us together into the fabric of his body, which is the church, of every kind and every place, I might say, he is the one to whom we turn at all times and in all circumstances of our life together. It seems so simple, this letting go and being embraced by the gift of God's love and forgiveness. 
this walking life and the promise of our baptism. Yet the reality of life tells us that here within lays the ultimate battleground of our existence. The ultimate battleground is right in my heart. My desire to be the king of my own throne of my heart. Or deposing myself and allowing God to take up residence in that rightful place within me. All the conflicts we see in the Middle East, all conflicts of all time, it started right there in the human heart. Hey, if God's in your heart, and you understand He loves you, and has forgiven you, and if something happens in the body of Christ, somebody says something, or you misunderstand it, or whatever, instead of bearing false witness against that person, gossiping about that person, you go to that person and say, hey, and you do this maybe, even in passing the peace. Say, hey, I need to talk to you sometime. I'm going to call you this. Fine. And you go and you say, hey, when you said this to me, that really hurt. What was that about? And so I didn't mean that. I meant this. And you forgive each other and you march on, right? Because now you don't want to hurt them. You love them. This is a brother or sister in Christ Jesus. This is, these are people you're going to spend eternity with. And you work it out. You work it through. You forgive one another. And you move on. So where's the retribution? It's gone. Where's the backbiting? It's gone. Where's the gossiping? It's gone. Where's the anger? It's gone. It's gone because there's mutual forgiveness and genuine love. And that's what God transforms our heart into. First John said we love because we have first been loved. We can't even love one another, our spouse, our kids, nobody, without God's love pouring in us and through us. That's where love comes from. God is love. And the only reason you can love self-sacrificially is because God dwells in you and allows you to overcome your sinful self and to die to yourself, to rise to newness of life, and to care and to love for one another. It's hard to do, but it's simple. It's all so simple. We thank God that He fills our hearts and minds with His Spirit. We thank God that He is our peace. We thank God that we have one another as brothers and sisters who make our way through this life together. We thank God because each and every one of you is a living stone full of the Holy Spirit, brimming over God pours gifts into our lap that we can't even hold. And they overflow, they splash on other people. And the more you give it away, the more God pours it into you. So that you can be a touch of His grace, His unearned love and favor to everybody with whom you meet. To be salt, an age, agent of preservation, an agent of, of healing, an agent of, of, of flavor, adding flavor to life. Just as you are, with your personality, your gifts, your abilities. To be salt in this body, in your community, in your family. To be an agent of healing and wholeness. As the old Adam dies, every time we confess our sins, God fills us with life. Even if we stumble, he picks us up, brushes us off, turns us back to the work that he's given us to do, and says, go, my daughter, go, my son, in my love and grace and mercy. I love others as I have loved you.
For the mighty friends we brought creation into being by a pillar of fire, we led your people into freedom. We praise you for the gift of your Son, who poured out your Spirit on his disciples of every race and nation. In the night when she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it for all of them to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, and the sending of the holy and life-giving Spirit, we await his coming anew to renew the face of the earth. And we pray that you would send now your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this meal, anoint us with your gifts of faith, hope, and love, that with thankful hearts we may be witnesses to your Son. Through him all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Together we pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
Lord of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord may say shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. Amen. Go with the Spirit of the Lord. Thanks be to God.